Hey everyone, welcome to the Sasquatch Outpost podcast, episode number 14. And I've got a great show prepared for you tonight with my guest Tom Powell, who I'll introduce shortly. But uh, can't wait to uh, see what's going to happen tonight. And Tom's a, a great guest. I've enjoyed having him in, in, uh, at conferences in the past and been looking forward to getting him on the show tonight so but before we do that hey patricia let me just see who's in our chat room wayne i saw uh who else is in there patricia is always there which i really appreciate brown dwarf doug coho good to see you appreciate you always being in yeah, so we got a few of, the, of our regulars in here, so hopefully more are going to tune in as we get a little further into the show. Uh, but before then, there's a there's a couple of things I want to mention. If you want to throw up that first PowerPoint there, I'm going to... So Cave Talks, we've got one this Saturday night. Now, this will end up being the first one because our weather was so crappy the first time we wanted to do one that no one signed up and I don't blame them. I wouldn't have either, but you can go online to, uh, to get your, your ticket or you can. in here is that better okay now could you hear anything i'd said up till now no oh gosh <laughs> well okay as i said we've got a great guest tonight and tom powell who i'll introduce shortly and as i was mentioning with the cave talks we've got one this saturday night at 7 p.m Got a few people signed up. We'd love to get a full house. So if you'd like to be a part of that and you can only decide at the last second to come, you're welcome to pay at the door. It's $25 uh, a person. And we're going to talk about some things that I normally don't talk about at conferences or even on my podcast. And let's flip over to the next one. So we've got three Three horseback expeditions this summer. One is full. Two are still open, July 10th through 12th and August 25th through 27th. That The graphic hid that last date. Um, and again, we'd love to get these filled up. These are the most popular trips we do. And we'd love for you guys to join us. It's great fun. The horses add a lot to the uh, event and I think serve as a draw for the Sasquatch. Let's skip on over. So next week, 
We've got a great show. This is a, a special episode, a two-hour, maybe two-hour-plus episode of the Sasquatch Genome Revisited. It's been 10 years since the Sasquatch Genome Project came out with their results, and they I was just watching their press conference again today, um, and I have the privilege of having Melba Ketchum, Adrian Erickson, Dennis Full, and Randy Brisson on all together next week. And I've already already got some hate mail, got some some heat, uh, which I totally expected. You know, people have very strong opinions about this study, uh, but this is an opportunity for the Genome Project to. Uh, share their perspective 10 years down the road, anything that they may um, have changed their minds about or believe the evidence has changed. And we're going to have lots of questions from the, the audience. I'm trying to get as many people in the, in the chat as we can. And we're going to divide it into two halves. First half will be their presentation. Second half will be more or less them responding to your questions. So, you can be writing down your questions as we go. And, um, but boy, do people have strong opinions about this. Man, oh man. I've gotten some emails with uh, some pretty uh, intense um, language and accusations. And I'm like, well, tune into the show, but, but uh, I'm going to give strict instructions to, to Stephanie um, and I'm going to get another moderator. If anybody gets out of hand or starts to attack, make personal attacks, you will be blocked. Sorry, that's just the way it's going to be. But we don't want everyone to get distracted by um, by the, the content of the chats. The chats should be comments about what we're talking about or questions to myself or any of my guests as tonight is the same. I think you can flip over one more slide. So got a giveaway tonight. Been meaning to do this. I need to do this more often. So those who've been in our museum, Sasquatch Encounter Discovery Museum, this is our big guy, our main man. If you can remember his name, the first person to write his name in the chat will get one of these uh, beanies that we sell that has a fake um, uh National Forest emblem, but it says National Forest Department of Sasquatch on it. And I would love to give that away. So let's see. Anybody I'm watching here to see who comes up first with the name. Hopefully somebody knows his name. As soon as somebody gives it, Steph, you can come in and tell us who it was. <laughs> no, it's not Gigantor, sorry. Nice try. Come on, somebody has to know this guy's name. I mean, it's not posted in the museum, but we talk about it all the time in the museum. Um <laughs> Okay, well, I don't see anybody uh, coming forth. Shoot, I'm going to have to come up with easier questions. I didn't think this was a hard question, but clearly it must be. Okay, I'll think of another question. I'll, I'll think of another question before we end, and we'll do another round. But his name is The Boss, all right? Our previous Sasquatch's name was Boomer. This one is the boss, Herman. Yeah, nice try. Herman would have been a good one. So I will come up with another question before the end. But uh, I want to go ahead and bring our guest in so we can remove that and bring Tom. You're there. You ready to talk about Sasquatch? Did you say Sasquatch? I did. Oh, um, I think I'm on the wrong podcast <laughs> i thought we were you said you wanted to look at my bigfoot evidence yeah and i said well it's 
doesn't get any better. But that's because it's really sore and it's gotten really big. And I thought you were a podiatrist. So yeah, that's a that's a big that's a big foot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, well, I'll fake it, I guess. Uh, yeah. But I sure appreciate it if you look at my foot. It's oh, nice. you're welcome. I'll uh, I'll give you my medical diagnosis at the end. Hey, in other words, you we can need turn... a better name for this creature. <laughs> any way you can turn up your sound at all from your end, Tom? Uh, I do not know. Uh, I could uh, pick up a microphone, but uh, here, let's try this. Is that better? How's that? Um, uh, keep going a little, little higher. I think that's it. I'm maxed out. You're maxed out. Um, you might try your headphones just so we can make sure we hear you well. All right. All right. Let's, Let's just see if that sounds any different. I don't want to miss anything. So. All right. Let's try. Hold on. I'm plugging this thing in. How is that? That is better. Okay. All right. Headphone it is. Okay. Hey, since you you uh you had a joke, I got a joke here. Uh here's the cartoon I just found. And this explains why Bigfoot is always blurry. It says don't forget to put it on the grainy setting. They're taking a selfie. Of course. <laughs> I've had a camera stolen before. I think it was stolen by Sasquatch. And uh, so when they take their selfies, they're putting it on the grainy. It should have said blurry, blurry setting instead of grainy. But uh, I thought that was funny. Oh, poor Sasquatch. The brunt of all the jokes. I've had cameras dismantled, too. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's Ron Moorhead used to say. If you haven't had an electronics failure, you haven't been doing this very long. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they affect electronics for sure. Um, I was at a conference, Tom, this past weekend in Cripple Creek. It was a Pikes Peak Paranormal Conference, and I was one of the speakers. And they gave me this as a gift. It's a disc, Frisbee disc. It's got Sasquatch in shades. Uh, I'll have to try it out and see how far it really goes. Okay. I've never I've never seen one of those. That's pretty cool. My wife says we gotta sell those in our store. Maybe we should. Um hey Uncle Bones, glad to have you in here. So um let me just do a quick intro. So Tom, Tom is a retired high school science teacher and uh which qualifies him from a lot of things, actually. Uh the fact that you've taught high school and you survived it. Uh, is phenomenal. Middle school um, also. You must have had great, great classes. I bet your students loved you and your sense of humor in class, no doubt. But uh, Tom, I got to know better um, when and Dave Pilates and, and Dennis and I invited him to come speak at a couple of the conferences we've done. And uh, Tom is one of my favorite speakers. I'm not saying that just to float your boat. You really are, Tom. Uh, I, I love what you have to share and your perspective, which is always a little bit different. And um, let's put that uh, that that um, PowerPoint back up. I want to show some of the books that Tom has written. It should be the last slide. There we go. So Tom's got three books. I know he's got another one coming out, but which he'll tell us about. Um, Shady Neighbors, uh, the locals and edges of science. Edges of science is his most recent, and it's been Shady a while since the. Shady Neighbors is a novel. Yeah, Shady Neighbors is a novel, and the locals is um, stories, right? Sasquatch encounter stories. Well, it's stories plus interpretation, speculations, things like that. Okay. Uh, it's pretty old by now, two thousand three, maybe two thousand five. I can't remember, but uh, um, a lot of the ideas that were put out back then were extremely controversial they're not as controversial anymore in most cases uh for instance in in 2003 uh it was being widely said that any sasquatch encounter outside the pacific northwest is hokum 
Uh, and I was strangely enough, one of the first, if not the first to say in print, oh no, it happens nationwide. Uh, and, and that was met with a certain amount of scorn and derision. I said that there are people who habituate the Bigfoot. They come around mm -hmm. their property on a routine basis or at least semi-frequently. And, and that was really controversial at the time. Uh, so, you know, the thinking changes. So when you were talking in the introduction about people who are critical and uh, of, of your guests coming in next time, um, you just got to remember that, that, that the thinking changes and where we were in 2000, 2003 is, is a, quite a distance from where we are now. Yes, it is. And Edges of Science, I know, is, is a look at kind of the more, it's not just Sasquatch, it's, it's a, several things on the paranormal, paranormal side of things. Um, anything you, you would say about Edges to promote it? No, just that I, I sort of overlay the, the Sasquatch phenomenon against other paranormal phenomena. As you can see from the cover there, that's a crop circle on the bottom and then, the, you know, the UFO uh, but what I explore is a potential sort of overlap, maybe even interaction between the paranormal phenomena. Each chapter is a different what the heck's with that. And then at the end of the book, I speculate as to how it all may interrelate. Yeah. Yeah. And I loved Edges. Um, I've read it. And uh, so anyway, um, um it's a privilege to have you tonight, Tom. And uh, and I'm curious. Um, I know from our just from knowing each other that uh, excuse me, you believe in Sasquatch. Why do you believe in in them? Well, actually, I don't. <laughs> Great. Uh, I don't believe in Sasquatch. I, I don't believe in a lot of things. You see, as a science teacher, you you kind of learn that. That's an inappropriate word in a science discussion. Okay. Belief means you accept without question and without the expectation of any evidence at all. I don't believe in very many things. I believe in, for instance, my wife, but I don't believe in Bigfoot. I don't believe in UFOs. I, I do conclude based on the evidence that I've seen that both things exist. But so I, you know, it's a semantic thing. And so I'm sorry to be all <laughs> nitpicky about it because everybody says, you believe in Bigfoot. And, uh, you know, yeah. I'd like to say, actually, I don't. But I do conclude that it exists. Yeah, uh, agreed. It's, it's That's one of several enough. semantic issues that really confuse people. Uh, another one is, uh, uh, where's your proof? And uh, say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, Proof is actually a very subjective thing. Um, one scientist might say, yes, he proved his, his uh, hypothesis. Another one say, no, I don't accept that as proof. There's questions there. The word that people should ought to be using is evidence, not proof. So, you know, and the question is, how much evidence does it take to make proof? No one knows. That's an irrelevant question. Um, so... I don't know. I think people get bogged down in where's your proof. Uh, and then the third one is the uh, theory. My theory is, it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. A theory in science has been tested and retested and confirmed several times before it gains a, the distinction of being a theory. Prior to that is a hypothesis. Well, most people aren't going to say a three-syllable word if they don't have to. And most people don't understand the word hypothesis. So they say, I have a theory about Bigfoot. And it's like, actually, you don't. <laughs> but in, in truth, theory has been used, misused so often that even right. the dictionary has sort of decided, OK, it can be a guess. But that isn't really scientifically how it started out. So I'm sorry, but as a writer, I'm a, a bit a nitpicky about these, um, you know, semantic issues. Like, for instance, people say there's a massive amount of evidence. It's like, well, actually, massive means heavy. The sun <laughs> is massive. Gold is massive. But you can't have a massive amount of evidence. What you have is a vast amount of evidence. So, yes. you know, once again. Uh, well, as an it, author, words are important, as you understand. And it is. But especially when you're talking about an issue like this, which is 
essentially unresolved. Yes. Um, but it is important to um, try at least to uh, use the correct words because it's so misleading, just like the word Bigfoot itself. You yeah. know, people go, what's that? Oh, well, that's one of these. And uh, it's like, okay, could we please use Sasquatch? I think one of the reasons the Sasquatch don't want much to do with us, is, uh, with us is they find the names very insulting. And I was even once told by some person who felt they knew that, you know what, they, they really hate that word squatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would think they hate Bigfoot even more. I would. I would not be one to named after, be named after a part of my body. Yeah. I would be big head, obviously. <laughs> I saw I saw a comic one time that showed it said uh, the famous member of the family returns and it shows this whole group of Sasquatches and one's got big lips, one's got big ears, one's got a big <laughs> butt, and and one of them says, Oh, here comes the famous brother, you know, just because he's got big feet. So yeah. Right. You know, that was a term that was coined by a by a newspaper a blogger, reporter. So a blogger in Northern California who was tracking a specific creature that they called Bigfoot. Right. And then the newspapers in Eureka, California, um, applied the word to the um, well, I guess in those days they they there was also the view that there was only one and his name is Bigfoot and he's like Elvis. He gets around a lot. Um, but, you know, uh, there was only one. And his name is Bigfoot. I still get that today. So you believe in Bigfoot? Well, where does he live? And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's not a he, it's a they. And then, of course, they look at me like, you mean there's more than one? <laughs> uh, sure. <yeah. laughs> so let me ask you this as a, um, as a retired high school teacher. And how long have you been retired now? Uh, since the pandemic, I was substituting. I actually retired a couple of years before the pandemic. And then I was substituting until all of a sudden the schools closed. And then I, I quit doing that. But I, I was teaching science for 32 years. Okay. And where, at what point did this whole interest with Sasquatch come into play for you? What was the beginning? I really would use it as a point of, of ridicule and uh, uh, sort of a lighthearted thing, but also a misapplication of science. You know, in other words, I didn't believe in it either. Um, to me, it was a, a misapplication of science. But the school district did have a movie, the Leonard Nimoy one from back yep. in the 70s, uh, In Search Of. And I would show it on the day before vacation because half the class was already like gone to Maui and they had to do something and it needed to be high interest. So I would show Bigfoot movies and um, I would use the school district movie. So that was fine. But then I moved to Clackamas County, which is uh, the most um, the, the highest number of Bigfoot sightings in Oregon. And I met people who said, you know, we have that out here. And I knew that at that point I was ridiculing it every year. Although I did watch the movie, and each year I watched the movie, I, I found it a little bit more compelling. So eventually I decided, gee, um, these people, my neighbors are, are saying that they're actually here. So the first thing I did is found a guy who researched uh, sightings, and he loaned me some track casts, and I would take them in and show them to the kids. But I would still ridicule it. But then I started experimenting with it myself, and, and I saw these people who... For instance, Forest Service employees have said, I've seen them, and um, it's not a joke. So I decided I was going to get to the bottom of this. And uh, trail cams had just come on the scene, at least to my awareness. And so I started putting them out. And I started getting some strange things. And uh, I couldn't really refute the, the uh, possibility that they were there. But little by little, I f found that the research became rather compelling and that there were definite patterns. And so I started accumulating all, saving it all on my hard drive. And, and uh, eventually I decided I have to get this into print before it, it's all lost. But by then I was a BFRO uh, region director sort of thing. And, and I managed all the sightings in the Northwest and, and there were just way too many for me to handle by myself. But what was neat is is mining the BFRO's trash and taking ones that they rejected as obviously fanciful and then investigating them anyway and, and getting with the people and finding out that they were dead serious and their uh, stories were compelling 
and also matched other people's stories, even some of the strange ones. So you you had access to those quote unquote rejected stories as well as what they were publishing. Uh, people who said they saw it dissolve. Yeah. Uh, and uh, people who uh, say, oh, they're, they're coming around on a routine basis. Um, they seem to be most interested in my daughter and, and, uh, and my kids and, and uh, things like that. Uh, and so that's when I decided, all right, I'm going to use my connections here to find a really good active area. And then I'm going to get some cameras installed up there, and it's it's got to work. I thought, man, this is just going to be a slam dunk. I'm going to put those cameras out, and two weeks later, I'm going to have pictures, and and there you go. I found that Mount Rainier is one of the highest, if not the highest, concentration of sightings in the whole uh, northwest, maybe even the country. And that, of course, Mount Rainier is in western Washington. It was about 100 miles away. And um, these people had a group of sightings. And so they were potentially these habituators who had gotten them used to their presence. And so I went out and visited them and everything was very compelling. And they said they're, they're taking food out of this freezer. They had an outdoor freezer and they were losing things. And first he accused the kids and the kids say, I didn't take anything out of there. And the strange thing was that the, the uh, ice cream bars were left but the side of a pig disappeared. Well, what kids are going to steal a side of a pig? Um, so I was pretty convinced that if we just put the camera on the fridge and load the fridge up with goods, that I should get the pictures. Everything stopped. And uh, then activity picked up on another part of their property. So we moved the cameras and then the refrigerator started getting hit again. And then this other place well, so we played this cat and mouse game for two years, uh, putting the cameras around and the cameras got more sophisticated. They became not still cameras, but video. And um, we were getting just hours and hours and hours of video, but uh, something would trigger the camera, but there was nothing there. It all became very um, frustrating. And after two years, I finally... Um, was starting to feel the frustration and so were the people they were very cooperative alan and april hoyt was their name and um then some kind of strange things happened but uh, we'll get to that once we get into some of these um stranger bigfoot um uh properties or, or tendencies but the idea was for two years we put cameras at that site uh, uh, and then um, we finally figured out how it might actually work better. You know, it's it's. Uh, I think it's proven now, at least for many researchers, that you want to make sure they don't come around. Just put a few cameras out. And I tell people that all the time, uh, especially people who say, you know, we we know they're here, um, and. It, I, I, it freaks me out. My kids are a little bit spooked and um, I don't like this. And and just like you said, I tell them, well, here's what to do. <laughs> yeah. Put some cameras out. <laughs> I've, I've even <laughs> known someone who put, put a, a bait. They had an outhouse on their property. They put some bait on top of the outhouse and then they had three or four cameras. It was a perfect camera trap where each camera looked at the next camera all the way around and they would come back and the bait would be gone and no camera showed anything. In fact, there would be periods where the, all the cameras would stop working and then start working again. And it was the most bizarre thing. And yeah, sure enough, they would have gone and taken the bait and didn't get a picture. So you get pictures of everything else. Uh, you get a picture of, yeah, <laughs> of everything else. I was involved well, in a program called Teachers in the Woods, and it was run by the Forest Service, and they would put uh, teachers to work doing field work for them. And they knew that I was doing cameras, and, and they wanted to learn how to set cameras themselves for things like wolverines and martens and, and some of the more esoteric species of wildlife that are sort of undocumented. So they asked me to do that and I agreed. And so for two summers, I went around setting up cameras and I had a little crew of foresters who went with me. And um, they we, we had several instances where the camera was in one case torn off the tree 
and it was locked to the tree with a cable and a lock. Hmm. It, uh, the, the cable was snapped, and the camera was lying face down on the ground undamaged. Another time, we found a camera where a leaf had been put over the lens. Oh, really? <laughs> and so it started to look like, um, you know, somebody was dismantling our gear but but what didn't make sense is if someone you know it was all very well hidden we didn't just put this along the pacific crest trail you know this was way off the trail sure and we would put things out there but the weird thing was that the cameras were never broken and they were never um stolen but they were in several ways dismantled and then after i stopped doing the project the guys who kept doing it um during the year for the forest service actually came to me once and said, you know, we, we've had that several more times where we, we got the cameras um, dismantled, but not um, broken. Well, I've heard of people who've had their camera, found their camera at the base of the tree that it was on, stomped into a hundred pieces. Yeah. Which, <laughs> you know, that's, that's another response. Um, have you found that, because you started off as a BFRO investigator. Are you still in that role? No, no. Okay. I was fired. For you the were fired. Why were you fired? For the unforgivable uh, sin of publishing a book. Uh, and that was the locals. When when Matt found out that I uh, published the book, he, he thought it was a tell-all. And, you know, he's an extremely quirky guy. Um, and so he thought this was going to be a tell-all book on the on on bfro dirt which it was not uh and in fact years later i saw matt again when he was involved in the tv show and and he actually brought the crew over to my place and they did some filming and i and i said so did you ever read the book and he said actually i i finally did and he said that that book sold more um of our uh more places on our expeditions than any other single thing <laughs> so you agree that it wasn't the the trashing that you thought it was <laughs> he had to reluctantly agree <laughs> so but yeah anyway it's a, a a mercurial guy and uh, uh he's settled down a little bit he's gotten yeah. wiser in his old age yeah i think so um so i would love to know and and let our our uh those who are watching and listening know over the years, I'm sure like me, I'm sure your thinking about Sasquatch has changed. I've probably gone through three or four different levels of change. I'm just curious how you've changed in your thinking and why. Well, uh, basically in a word, I guess you'd have to say I've gone paranormal. In other words, um, I've, I've stopped looking for evidence of a um, primate. Uh, at first, you know, I was, of course, okay with the idea that it was an undiscovered primate. Sure, I think we all primate, started there. You know, ape family. Um, that was just the thinking at the time. It became clear to me that, that there was something much more sophisticated going on as a consequence of my... Um, presence at Allen and April's up there by Mount Rainier. One of the most um, relevant stories was that one night I sat out at Allen and April's house every night at what for no for one night for the almost the entire night and every 15 minutes I would do three knocks on a tree with a baseball bat. Knock, knock, knock. Because you know everybody knows that Bigfoot goes around knocking on trees. And uh, so I just did that all night long. This was at their place and I finally gave up at 3.30 in the morning and then foolishly decided to drive home. And uh, foolishly because it was an incredible struggle to stay awake. And made it 100 miles by doing isometrics on my steering wheel. And then I got to my place 100 miles away and I pulled up just as the sun is just barely showing on the horizon. I'm a zombie. I, I just need to walk straight to my bedroom door. And as I get out of the car and slam the door, whack, whack, whack comes out of my woods. <laughs> I was being toyed with. 
that was the first indication. And boy, I really had to think about that. What just happened? I couldn't even consider going back into that woods to see what was going on. I was so wiped out. But a, a hundred miles I, away. I, I think it knew. <laughs> so yeah. if that isn't a sign that, that you're being toyed with, well, it was a sign to me that I was being toyed with. And that's when I started to realize, uh-oh, I'm dealing with something that's a, a little bit more sophisticated than I realized yeah. before. And then little by little, other things have then happened since in my quest to find, you know, just a better evidence, which I've more or less given up doing. But also, once I started diving into this question of communication, can one communicate with them? And if so, how would that best be done? And what have you found on that? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um it's very interesting. One way I would suggest that anybody who wants to try to get closer to them, um, you think about them. Just think about them. And um, it does seem that thoughts convey. Now, that's pretty paranormal right there, but um, it gets better. Um, I... Uh, was working at Allen and April's and not getting anything. And then Ray Crow, who ran a um, Bigfoot um, meeting every month in Portland, um, introduced me to a guy named Steve Fredericks. And he says, Tom, I want you to meet this guy because he's got some interesting stories and he's got some interesting insights. Steve had several Bigfoot sightings and he felt like he knew how to communicate with them. And I said, okay, Steve, that's perfect. Let's give this a try. Here's what I want you to do. Um, I want you to ask them to step in front of the camera at Allen and April's. He said, um, well, it would help if I could drive around the area. And I said, well, okay, but I'm not going to tell you where it is. I can't reveal the site because if we're going to be any kind of scientific here, we have to have this single blind thing going on where you don't know what's being done and the people who don't who live there don't know what's being done. So I said to Steve, all right, I will tell you the general area. And he said, fine, that's all I need. And so he drove around on what's called Kruger Road up there by this town of Onalaska where things were going on. And then he called me back and he said, OK, I did what you said. And I said, all right. Um, you asked them to step in front of the camera. And, and let's uh, just review. You had been trying for over two years to get them to do that very thing. And getting nothing. And so I said, Steve, ask him to step in front of the camera. So the first thing that Steve said is, the first, first said, first of all, Tom, they were really impressed that you asked. Hmm. There's a big clue for your listeners. <laughs> no tricks, no traps, but try asking. Now, I don't consider myself any kinds of any kind of sensitive, any kind of psychic. I consider myself actually a little bit thick in that area. So I really like the idea that asking someone else to do this. And then um, I never told Alan and April that I was doing this. Within 48 hours of Steve tendering this request, Alan calls me up and says, Tom, you got to see this we got our best image on the camera. Hmm. And I said, I'll be right there. Drove up 100 miles, and here was this shadow of a head and shoulders moving across the field of view. But it was a shadow uh, as if it was projected on the, on the backdrop of foliage, but there was, you really couldn't see any detail. It was just a form. It was just an outline. And I said, okay, well, that's really not going to sell the, this deal. We need better evidence than that. And so I didn't tell Steve we got anything. Oh, by the way, this little clip is now in Cliff's museum. So oh. even, even our guy Cliff uh, Barrickman thinks it's a pretty decent piece of uh, footage. But it wasn't by all obvious you know, evaluation standards, it, it just wasn't going to sell this deal. It was just an outline. It was almost like they were doing little shadow puppets. Um, so I said to Steve, Steve, I want you to do the experiment again. 
and, he, and I said, I want you to ask them for a bone. And um, Steve said, oh, Tom, they're not going to like that. And I said, I know, Steve, just, just do it. And he said, okay, I'll call you when I feel like I've tendered the message. So he did. And he, again, it took him a week or two before he finally called me back and he said, um, they, I don't know whether I got through, but I, I, I tried to tender this message through the psychic channels. And I said, thank you very much, Steve. That's all I said. Didn't ever tell Alan in April that I was trying anything at all. Less than 48 hours later, on December 31st of 1999, um, Alan called me up and said, you wouldn't believe this, but we just found a bone at the base of the camera tree. <laughs> So I said, well, tomorrow's New Year's Day. I better, better hang around. But um, day after tomorrow, I'll be up. So we, I got up and he presented me with a, a bone that looked for all the world like a saucer, like a tea saucer. And um, it was very thick. And long story short is after I took it to several wildlife biologists, it turned out that it was an emu breast bone. So I went back to Alan and said, and do you have emu? any around there and he said my dad raises emus and my dad lives five miles away how do you think you how do you think the emu bone would have gotten from your dad's to your place he says i do not know hmm. so where did you find this bone he said right at the base of the camera tree so finally they all this weird stuff was going on their phones were being tapped it was, it was just everything was going crazy and so they said tom we want to stop we're done we're going to take down the cameras i said fine i'm done too at that point i told steve fredericks the whole story for the first time and he hit himself on the forehead and he said i never specified what kind of bone i just said could they we have bone. a bone yeah and uh to me that almost suggests a sense of humor yeah because it wasn't a local species bone. No, no. But they said, you want a bone? Here's a bone. But of course, <laughs> they're, they're not going to dig up one of their relatives. I right, mean, right. if I asked you for a piece of one of your relatives, would you agree and I go would to not the garden and, nope. and dig it up? No, no. I mean, you know, I, was, I was asking for way more than I was entitled to. But, but it, it was pretty funny the way um, they obliged presumably i have no other explanation for how that bone got there and believe me i have thought of everything so so what your story says to me is a couple of things one i mean when when he was communicating with him was he doing it verbally when he was out no, in the woods no this is this is um basically the guy is what you might call a horse whisperer okay he's one of these people who has the gift of, of trans species communication i have met several of these and um i my daughter was an equestrian and uh several of the of the fellow equestrians um had this ability to um understand what the horse is feeling and and among equestrian people this is pretty well known it does mm -hmm. seem that these same people who are have this ability to communicate with animals are that is where i would start and it, and and i've now found three or four different people who felt that they could uh similarly communicate um with the sasquatch but um if you want to find one of these people uh look around the equestrian crowds okay interesting and so then just they, tell them what you want them to communicate do telepathically i guess is Very the word you would so. use yes yes the, the mind the mind it appears i've read a lot of psychology about this the, the mind actually is exists outside the brain our, our memories are stored out here and the mind extends beyond the body and in even this the the conservative scientific circles in general will agree with that so, so it says it says there's a there's got to be a very s significant level of intelligence for one. Yes. For them to and, and there's this collective consciousness at work, which is basically what you're using to, to um, attempt communication. Right. Because I, I can't imagine someone trying to communicate with a gorilla or a chimpanzee in the same way. I don't see why that is not possible. 
I mean, um, uh, there, there are a couple of uh, writers. One is this English guy, Rupert Sheldrake, and he cites many, many examples of people who had communication with animals. Most typically, it's, of course, with the dog. The dog knows when they're coming home. And yeah. even before the car is being heard or even when the car is a few miles away, the dog has its nose pressed against the glass waiting. It, it knows when the uh, person's coming home. Um, but Rupert Sheldrake is a very a, a interesting author when it comes to many, many examples of this communication, interspecies communication and um, other things like that. So I, I had, I'd written down a question kind of anticipating we were going to go this direction a little bit. If ah. someone is trying to communicate with the Sasquatch, how would they know if they were answered? Well, obviously you don't. And that's the problem. And that's why this kind of stuff will never really rise to the level of scientific um, expectation is because it's always assumed that it's... Um, you know, a self-fulfilling prophecy, what they call the Rosenthal effect. Mm -hmm. You 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 think you heard it, you talked yourself into it, and and I can't prove otherwise. Uh, so you you I guess it's a leap of faith, um, and um, one that science abhors. But it is interesting how um, the responses are so similar. And another good example, I know this PhD soil scientist named Bob Faust, who has also studied shamanic things in Hawaii and in Ecuador. And when he explained that to me, I said, Bob, let's go camping. He and my buddy Guy Edwards and I went camping to one of my favorite areas in uh, the Mount Hood National Forest um, called or the Roaring River. And we set up a camp deep in the Roaring River. And I said to Bob, now I want you to um, see if you can't open up lines of communication using some of this shamanic stuff that you have um, learned over the years. He said, okay, let's go. And so Guy and I are just sitting there around the campfire, you know, drinking a beer. We're not in any, you know, ohm state or anything, but Bob goes into a trance. Well, first he gets out a little cloth thing that looks like a Ouija board, but it's made of cloth. He sets it on his lap. He holds this crystal on a string and it starts to swing. And then he goes into a trance and then um, he, he says, okay, there you are. And um, could we ask you some questions? And then comes, you know, all this replying is coming out of his mouth. So, you know, again, science would say, oh, the guy's making it up. I don't think he had the incentive to do so. And he was, he was pretty indifferent. But first thing he said is, um, what's your name? And he claimed that the response was Pulina. My name is Pulina. Hey, hold on just a second, Tom. I'm trying to get my mic sorted out here where I can right. hear you better so pulina is the name and he says how many of you are there and the answer he was given was there's two of us there's me and there's my son and then he said where do you have a husband and she said yes and bob said where is he and the response was the star people took him and the next question bob asked is is he coming back? Answer, I don't know. Bob said, can we see you? We would just like to see you. And the response was, I can't do that. Bob said, why not? Response was, um, there's a rule in our society that you are not to be seen. The only thing worse than being seen is to be photographed. I've never been seen. And I'm not about to screw up now. And then that was the end of the of the alleged conversation. Now, again, Bob was recounting both sides of the conversation. I don't blame any scientific minded person for, um, you know, dismissing the whole thing as hokum. Stephanie, are you hearing Tom? OK. Any anyway. my end then. OK, well. Uh, I can hear you, so if this is really strange, I'm not sure what. If you if you ask a question and you're not sure it's conveyed, I'll I'll just repeat the question. Uh, 
Okay. Maybe that did it. Say something, Tom. Let me see if I've got you. Uh huh. Okay. I've got you back. I, I, there, a setting changed just by itself. And I missed uh, the last five minutes of what you were saying. Well, just that, that some interesting dialogue happened. Okay. And the most interesting thing was no, you can't see us because it's a rule. And I'm not about to screw up now. I've never been seen and I'm 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 gonna abide. <laughs> well, they they seem to have rules that they go by that they they won't violate. Um and have you ever known of a researcher that was injured in some way by a Sasquatch or attacked or no, but I do remember in the BFRO days that there was a uh, person up the Santiam River who found a camper that had the door torn off it, and the person was missing and had not been seen, and using the license plate, they traced it back to this family that lived in Salem and the, they said where is your your I believe it was the grandfather okay and they said he went up in the woods where he felt the Sasquatch were and he was going to shoot one and um he, he was never seen again <laughs> wow <laughs> well you could imagine I can imagine um if they were going to uh, demonstrate any aggression or violence that would be in response to being shot at or someone attempting to hurt them, for sure. I, I talked to a person in, in Tennessee and a person in Louisiana who both said they shot one and it looked at them like, what did you just do that for? And then it walked away. <laughs> so, so that's um, actually something that the literature has borne out some of the older books um on the subject uh one by a guy named jim brandon and he found an example too of uh, a person who who felt like they shot it several times and then it, it strode off uh, seemingly unfazed they seem to be able to take a, a bullet i don't know how they do that i don't know um what if it's a physical thing of muscle mass or something else but i've heard numerous stories of them being shot at or being shot even by forest rangers and and falling down and then getting up again and walking away and so well then, there, then there's the case that uh you know happened in northern cal where uh, i forget the guy's name who felt that he shot one while he was bear hunting Smay and justin Smeha. that's correct and he felt that he shot one and then he got very scared and took off but then he was encouraged by others to go back and and get some remains for scientific analysis and he went back and um there were no remains and I felt like I could have told you that <laughs> yeah. um, when, when, if, if one of their brethren die, they do not leave it face down in the dirt and just get a, go on with their life. They're going to gather that uh, body up and they're going to give it a proper burial. So the big question people, well, where's the bones? And it's like, well, they're, they're buried and they're concealed and, and they bury their dead just like we bury ours. They I've are heard, close heard to the same human. thing. Mm -hmm. If if not, you know, that's another question. Why why does the DNA always come back as something strange? And the most common DNA is well, that's you idiot. You contaminated the sample. That's human DNA. They they never entertain the possibility that that's actually what they have. <laughs> is human DNA correct? Yes, or at least partial. Now I I don't know if you mentioned this while my my mic was cut out and I couldn't hear. I know you've done a lot of research on their 
origins and and i think you've got kind of a unique perspective uh, i would love for you to take a few minutes to talk about where you think they come from and how they hide so effectively from us well i i, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of contact with native americans around here and i put myself out there you know as the not expert but just a devotee and so sometimes guys will come up to me at, at events and say uh you want to meet me in the bar i'll tell you a little bit and um what the indian uh line it seems to be is that they emanate from underground that okay. they have underground hideouts which helped that me at least come up with a potential answer to this question of when they're not around where do they go they they must have some place to hunker down and these stick structures that people find around the woods that look like little teepees and stuff in no way shape or form would provide any kind of shelter no uh so I, i'm sure that they're making these stick structures at times to mark places for some reason but i know that that's not their shelter well finally the indian said well they come from underground dude and i'm like oh that makes perfect sense uh, so what caves and stuff well yeah um you know i was told that for every one cave we know about there's probably 10 that we don't and if if they're using these underground hideouts as as their inner sanctum uh, they're going to conceal the entrances uh so um you know it's not like you can just go into a known cave and but but there have been people over the years especially uh I know of at least one here in Oregon who did enter a cave, which was an old mine, and and they uh, got scared out of there by something that that was very big and intimidating and didn't want them in there, and um, hmm. they didn't get much of a look at it, but um, they felt that it was a Sasquatch that was hunkered down in this cave. So there's a fair amount of, you know support for the view that that they they emanate from underground yeah um, but as far as where they or where they originate um historically is 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 that more the question you're asking no um well we could go there as well but it was more just trying to figure out you know how do they how are they able to hide why don't we find bones and if they do bury their dead i've even heard native americans say that they bury them and then they roll a big boulder over the spot so you would never even know there was a grave there. Well, um, there was a guy in Ron Lewis, uh, a guy named Ron Lewis in Ohio who I knew pretty well. And I was back there for my dad's funeral and it was in the middle of the winter. And he said, I know where there's a grave. Would you like to see it? And I said, sure. Um, he said, you got to promise not to touch it. And I said, okay. Um, so we went out in the night. It was a, actually a snowstorm. And he took me actually to an area where I had camped as a Boy Scout called Punderson State Park. And we hiked through the woods in the dark, in the snow. And he showed me this huge mound of stones. And he said, we, my buddy and I tried to dismantle this. And we, 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 we got, in, we got in trouble. <laughs> we took some of it apart. And we really felt like we were going to find something in there. Of course, these days you're risking antiquities act sure. violation. Yeah. You know, if that's an Indian grave and you disturb it, boy, you're in big trouble. Um, anyway, he foolishly started taking the grave apart. They were beset by mosquitoes. And so they got the heck out of there. And their plan was to come back the next day with, with bug dope on. And they were going to finish the job. Both of them had the same horrible dream that night in which a creature came into their bedroom and said put my grave back <laughs> oh boy. and ron got up at 4 30 in the morning and called his buddy and said uh we got to put the grave back and his buddy said i know and then they wow sort of commiserated on and they, sure enough they, they were both told in no uncertain terms um put that grave back so I, I'd be the first to tell people, even if you think it is a Sasquatch grave, don't touch it. Don't, yeah, don't mess with it. I, I heard a, 
a strange story. A, a guy came into my store one time and said that he was hunting in California. Saw a, he was hunting deer. Saw a big buck. Shot it. Uh, killed it as far as he could tell. But right after he shot it, he was pushed off of a uh, a hill and fell down to the bottom and injured himself. He couldn't. He never saw what pushed him, and so. Um, I think he broke his shoulder or some dislocated the shoulder. Anyway, he was, um, it's a long story. He got, he got back to his vehicle, saw some Sasquatch on the way back, but came back to that location maybe uh, months or a year later, just to see what happened to that buck. And he's looking and he's looking and he can't find it. And suddenly he, he finds this great big rock and he sees this, just the end of the antler sticking out from under the rock. And so it had, they had actually taken that buck, buried it and pushed a rock over it. And just, there just happened to be a piece of the antler sticking out, which kind of corroborates how they deal with dead things that they want to hide. And, uh, they certainly had the strength to move rocks, big rocks. Um, I wouldn't think that would be a big problem for them. But, um, you know, what do you, um, what do you think? And if you, if you care to give an answer to this, I don't know, this may be a longer answer, but what do you think they are in their essence? I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm quite sure they are at least as smart as we are. Okay. All I know is what they're not. And of course, where's your proof, Tom? I don't have it. Uh, but my hunch, my conclusion, based on what of everything that I've experienced and everything I've heard from other people, is that they are at the very least hominid. In other words, we do share enough DNA that you probably could, um, you know, uh, Human Sasquatch DNA, I think, could be um, commingled. Okay. Uh, I think they're they bear most of the same DNA that we have, but they do have capabilities that we absolutely do not, and they are capabilities that are you know almost shamanic in yeah. terms of like I said the communication and the ability to. Uh, move around. Uh, I am quite sure that they could be, if they wanted to, in the room with you and I and that you could not see them. So they have these shamanic-like tricks up their sleeve. But, you know, there are people um, who have these capabilities as well. Most typically, um, you know, you get these monks and um, um, who are the t Tibetan monks who who can do some of these things as well so they have mental capabilities that exceed our own i am quite certain of that does that might not disqualify them from being human but they're at least human and if not perhaps uh superhuman someone just put up the question what my thoughts are i i would tend to agree with you um I am I am as sure as I can be, and I can never be 100% sure, but I'm as sure as I can be that they are not a undiscovered species of great ape. If they were a great ape, they'd be in zoos for the past 75 years at least. Um, well, but, yeah. people, of course, talk about how, you know, there was a time when we didn't know gorillas existed. But once we went looking for them, it didn't take them very long to find. No, no. There are still animals we haven't found, you know, supposedly pileated, no, not pileated, but ivory-billed woodpeckers are not as extinct as we think they are. And, and But, you know, there are so many people who've been looking for so long that if all they were were an ape, we would be there by now. We would. There's something and, and, much more complicated going on. Yeah, and we wouldn't have to go to the Congo to find them. They're on our doorstep. And so if they are here and in every single state has evidence of sightings, then um, if they were a chimpanzee or an orangutan or a gorilla, 
surely we would have figured out how to capture them by now. And not only we haven't, no one has anywhere in the world. So, there, are, there are tribal people who have said, historically, we used to trade with them. Yeah, I've heard that. But about the time that the white settlement arrived, they pulled back and we don't see them anymore. Yeah. But but if you get to with the tribal folks, they will basically say they're just a tribe. They're another tribe. That's all they are. They're just a big hairy tribe. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, they're adapted to living out of doors without yeah. um, the need for um clothing and stuff. And if you're living subterranean i would think it would be on the chilly side down there so you're gonna need sure. a, a coat of fur well the subterranean idea is is fascinating to me um one which i want to i want to think about some more it does answer some questions it obviously presents other questions as well but any any hypothesis does and so are you familiar with karst topography no. limestone Limestone um, dissolves with groundwater to make very large, what they call solution openings, caves. When you get karst topography, there also seems to be a concentration of, guess what? Sasquatch sightings. Hmm. Um, so some people suppose that they leave their underground hideouts uh, almost as a uh, source of um, relaxation, a vacation <laughs> they're just cruising around because uh, you know they want to see the what's going on out there they want to see the wildlife i.e us yeah so. <laughs> mm, sure sure and they do watch people with great interest uh and you know stay out of the sight i guess one of the biggest if not the biggest advantage that i enjoy is I know some people who are really, really experienced and really, really good thinkers about this. And one of them is this guy named Henry Franzoni. And he has some Native, Amer Native American heritage in his own blood, but he also uh, has a lot of contact with tribal types. And he um, brings in quite a bit of this kind of information. Um, you know, so when you get the tribal people to open up you you do find that there's ones who claim frequent interaction there's ones who say they can communicate with them um that they understand english and and i've seen examples of that at allen and april's one of the things that they said was they know our names they know mom you know april was the mom and she said i hear my name mom but it's coming from the woods. Oh, and I know all my kids are in the house. <laughs> <laughs> and other times their daughter, Nina, they, they would hear the, the voice saying, Nina, Nina. Um, so um, I do believe they, they can um, use some English. Sure. And they do have their own language for sure. As Ron Moorhead, you know, he's another great friend and, and a, really just a great thinker on this stuff. Um, but he's the one who produced the um, Sierra sounds. And um, I, I find that his recordings are one of the most compelling pieces of evidence there is. It's right up there with the Patterson-Gimlin footage. Well, and Scott Nelson obviously has done in, intense analysis of the Sierra sounds. And as a cryptolinguist, he's come up with quite a few. I mean, he spoke at the conference I was at this past weekend. Fascinating, uh, fascinating talk. And um, he he re, he's convinced 100% that it's a language. It has all the characteristics of English or any other language. And we just don't understand the words. We don't know what they mean. But they have the same inflection when they ask a question. Their, their tone goes up at the end. And they have negation, which only, only language speakers can do, where they bring no in or negate something so it was fascinating and he would take these phonemes or these sounds and he would slow them down and you could hear what sounds like individual words just fascinating fascinating to me and and anthropologically speaking the definition of human is a, a member of the ape 
um, family that can communicate. Hmm. Um, you know, and so that's what, where the hominid is distinguished from the pongid is communication. Yeah. Um, language, specifically language. Humans, uh, up until recently, were thought to be the only ones. Now we know that dolphins do, whales do, um, and um, I don't know, several other uh, creatures, but especially dolphins, definite language. Last, last question. Uh, do you think we will ever catch one or kill one? Uh, I believe that remains have been acquired uh, and um, they are spirited away by government folks. And so, you know, that's another one of these eye rollers. People, oh, great, here we go with the conspiracy theory. <laughs> and that's like, well, first of all, theory is the wrong word. Don't get me started. <laughs> yeah. And, but, you know, yes, I, I'm sure that remains have been acquired. Uh, probably remains were acquired after the eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980. I've heard that possibility. But yeah. they um, get spirited away. And um, for some reason, they... Um, are not shared out and i i think it's because once they examine and understand these that there is somehow a connection to the um whole alien slash ufo biz that there is some overlap there and um you know we all know that the government is has not been forthcoming on that subject so no. why would they share out the presence of Sasquatch if they knew. And I think it's because, um, well, they always say, oh, because it would destabilize religion. You know, all of a sudden we share the planet with other intelligent beings. Right. Um, well, I got no problem with that. Um, it wouldn't destabilize me, but, um, you know, that's the excuse that is used. But I sure. do believe that once a, once a the government agency gets their teeth into secrets. They just are going to hang on to those secrets because um, they see it as their job to uh, protect the secrets in case there's some, sure. you know, tactical sure. value. Um, but but will we ever be able to prove their existence? And the answer is uh, probably not. Um, I've stopped trying because I know that that's working at cross purposes to what they want, or at least I suspect it. And um, I also know that it's it's after having tried to do that and advise others to do it for um, a couple of decades, it, it feels more and more like a fool's errand. And instead, what I have decided is that I, I don't want to prove anything because I know I cannot, hmm. but I do want understanding. And I think understanding is more valuable to me than proof. I know they exist. I'm okay with not being able to prove it, but I do want to understand it. And if you want understanding, you you cannot seek proof at the same time. You have to figure out which way you want to go because they're two yeah. completely different directions. And understanding means you're not asking for proof. You can really progress by leaps and bounds, but as soon as you get bogged down in the search for evidence, I should say, not proof, but um, whatever it is you're trying to get, um, it, it just completely changes your approach into something that is um, almost certainly counterproductive. On the other hand, I don't discourage people from trying it their way. You sure. know, Cliff Barrickman is my good buddy, and he's as flesh and blood as they come. Well, we're good friends, and we, we just agree to disagree, and then we go fishing. And uh, we talk <laughs> about it, and we um laugh about it but um i don't try to stop him from getting evidence sure and he doesn't stop me from going off telepathically and trying to get communication and talk to him and find out what their names are so everybody has their approach i do look with disdain on people who want to shoot them but i know that yeah. especially in a state like texas there's people who love their guns and 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 they're trying to shoot one and there was a tv show about that for a while and I know I can't stop these people. I'm, 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 I'm thinking that they are not going to be successful. And I'm thinking that there are probably a public nuisance um, to be out there shooting at upright things. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, possibly people. So yes, that's what I mean. Um, yeah. 
so um, I, I do not approve of that, but I know that I cannot stop these people and, and I'm not going to waste my time trying. Well, I'm, I, I'm like you. Um, I think I'm, I'm past the point of trying to prove that they exist. I know they exist, but proving that is a whole different ball game. I'm going backpacking at the end of the month with a, with a, a guy coming in from out of state, a longtime friend. And I think we've agreed together that we're not going to take any equipment. We're not going to take any cameras. We're not going to take any recorders because whatever happens, we want to just be their gift. If I could use that term, their gift to us of understanding, like you said, and not trying to prove anything and, and just to see how differently they behave towards us. So there, there are some things you could do that are, I think, not uh, too intrusive into their world, but in, invite a response. And, um, you know, we started out putting out a lot of food and, uh, you know, little by little, we finally came around to the view that they're not starving, um, <laughs> but, but they will acknowledge, um, you know, sometimes we've had things taken and they put other things back. Right. Um, and one of the things you can do with them is play little games, um, take some Scrabble pieces out there mm. and spell mm. words. And, um, well, there's an and, idea and, I hadn't thought of. Uh, and we, we tried that at a place down by Eugene, Oregon, and we came back and the words were rearranged, uh, or the, 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 the things were rearranged. And in one case, um, they were using, they were trying to spell a word that had ease in it and they didn't have enough ease. So they took a three and turned it around. Seriously. Wow. <laughs> uh, we, we put out um, sticks in a tic-tac-toe sh shape, um, you know, a little thing like this. Yeah. And then we, we had two sets of stones, one set of agates. And then I think the other one maybe was pine cones or something. And we uh, initiated a game of tic-tac-toe and, um, they would cheat. <laughs> we would come back and they had added things. And then they started moving our pieces. I was like, wait a minute, you don't understand the rules of the game. Um, so, you know, play little games like that and, and you Absolutely. Will add, get some really interesting results. Obviously, nothing you can take to the bank. Uh, and everybody's sure. Oh, you're making that up, or oh, you're just imagining things, or oh, somebody's coming around and playing games with you, and it's like, well, okay, but I, we, we were careful. We, we took all the precautions, uh, but, but they, they know what you can take to the bank and what you can't, and that yeah. is exactly the um, line that they will not cross. Um, yeah. But have some fun with it and, uh, and keep track. Oh, and take pictures of everything with yourself. Yes. yes. And, Definitely uh, take a, a phone for pictures, not to get their picture, but right. pictures and, of what and, they and do. Every time you come back and check your little game or whatever it is, um, take another picture. And, and it's amazing how many times the stuff has been rearranged. Yeah. Now, I can't prove that it isn't a, it isn't a Raven doing that. Sure. Um, but again, they, they, they know what you can and can't prove, and they're just not going to give you something that you can ballyhoo around town and, and be the big hero like Peter Byrne tried to do for so long. The Scrabble idea is genius. I'm definitely going to take some Scrabble pieces and see what they do. Uh, there's also these little letters that are on dice. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can use those too. And uh, that's where we had the three you know, that it turned the dice to a, a three and, um, and and used it as an E. Um, but then while you're at camp, you know, it is important to, I think, think about them a lot and even yeah. do little spiritual things, um, play guitar, uh, music mm -hmm. is a good one. Um, and um, what I think that does is, is invites them to come in on you um, in a way that, that they it might take a long time otherwise uh you really you know don't expect anything to happen your first night out but if you stay out there for three four five nights then things start to happen i think i'm going to take um i've got some recordings of native american flute music and i'll take a little speaker and just play that into the woods at mm -hmm. night 
and see how well, they don't even flute. just play a little flute. You don't even have to know how. Um, there are these things, um, these these drums that are called tongue drums, and you can buy one on Amazon, and they sound beautiful. You you tap it with this stick, and it makes this mm -hmm. ringing sound. And you kind of roll the stick around. Yeah, and yeah. and those make a great noise. Uh, so you're just trying to do all of these uh, semi-spiritual things and um, convey sure. to them a, a reassurance that you're not sitting there with a uh, rifle in your lap. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, there, there, is a, there is a sense of spirituality. Um, and I guess the one last thing I would say is if, if you know somebody who feels like they have this interspecies communication, this horse whisperer, um, that's a good person to bring to camp. Yeah. At least if, if they can't come to ask them to speak to the Sasquatch on our behalf and let them know we're coming. So check your horses for breeds. Yeah. We've had that. We, we showed that, uh, last week. We've had that numerous times. I've, I've shown, I've shown that to people and, and, and they were horse people. And one of them said, that's incredible. And the <laughs> other one said, oh, the wind does that. It's like what? Yeah, no. <laughs> the wind doesn't take it and braid it. I mean, it's sometimes just, the uh, the attempts to be scientific and explain it away is more ridiculous than is. than any of the paranormal considerations. Well, and very often the truth is actually stranger than fiction. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well, Tom, whatever, it's been a delight as always to have. Whatever you happens, you. it won't be what you expect. No, so no, so be no. prepared for something out of left field <laughs> unexpected yep well i know from the comments everyone's enjoyed having you on the show there's been lots of great comments and, uh, uh, give me a few months to finish my next uh to yes publish my next one uh right now the um the title is outside the box okay. it really doesn't delve too much into the sasquatch per se but rather again goes into um some of these paranormal mysteries that science cannot explain and then i uh, perhaps a little bit arrogantly attempt to explain them myself <laughs> but you, it's real to stick your neck out and just make predictions and 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 see if you're right i'm just not afraid to be right one of my biggest hobbies is i i love to predict the future okay do you have a a website or somewhere people can contact you or purchase your books or um i don't um i haven't i have i used to have a blog but i i quit doing that just because it was so time consuming sure uh, but when i um get my book finished i'll i'll have one and and get it all going okay. again but but right now um all i can say is um look for me on the internet um and uh email me at thom.powell at yahoo.com but um you know i i don't check my email every day and like everybody else my email gets heavily spammed so sure i i try to answer people but um i do miss some stuff so if you are trying to reach me be persistent and we will have more copies of edges of science in our store soon tom's going to send us some and we'll be selling those as well. But uh, don't forget, next week is the special podcast with the Sasquatch Genome Revisited. And hopefully it will be a positive experience. And maybe we'll all learn something that we didn't know. Thanks again, Tom. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Live long and prosper. Bye-bye.